Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, this is the last session of this webinar series on monitoring water quality using satellite image processing. We already had two earlier uh, sessions. In the first one, we had an overview and analysis of NASA remote sensing data, especially for HEB monitoring. We focused on chlorophyll A concentration. We also talked about other parameters. We had an overview of Giovanni and Ocean Color Web. This was in uh, week one. Um, we downloaded some data and we did analysis uh, using CDAS in week two. We had a demonstration of different features of CDAS, and then you worked with Lake Victoria file, uh, ocean color file that you downloaded from Ocean Color Web, and then you analyzed that using CDAS. You also did um, not only just visualization, but calculated statistics and also did mathematical operations using spectral refractances for Lake Victoria file. So today now, the focus is going to be on a little further. Uh, if we do not have level two files, in this case, we had level two data for MODIS from Ocean Color. But something like Landsat Operational Imager, we don't have level two data in Ocean Color website. So how do we analyze Landsat data? Say? So that is going to be the focus of today. Again, this is just a reminder that this is the website where all the information is, and this is the listserv uh, that RSET has where you can sign up. So overall outline for today is that we'll have an overview of image processing. There is a special software. It's called Ocean Color Science Software, or OCSSW. This is part of the CDAS software. So um, we are going to see how you can install this or download this within CDAS. And we will also see how we can analyze this level one Landsat data to level two, how to get level two data from that. Once you have level two data, then you can use CDAS to do analysis that we did last week uh, using MODIS level two data. So we'll have um, convert level one to level two, and we will focus this on Lake Victoria. We'll have images for Lake Victoria from Landsat only, and we'll do the conversion. And then Africa is going to demonstrate how to use Landsat images and in situ data, uh, which help you develop algorithm. And she's going to focus on Gulf of Mexico region for that. So we will have two demonstrations, and then we will summarize our series, and then we'll have question answer. So this is an overview of this Ocean Color uh, Science software, or OCSSW. And we again want to acknowledge our Ocean Biology Processing Group um, friend Daniel Knowles. He has helped us um, with some of these slides and also in explaining how OCSSW works. So here is the, once you go to CDAS, you can download installation and then um, I will quickly demonstrate after the slides how to do that. But once you go to CDAS, there is a way to download and install OCSSW. And once you click on that, you will be asked for different missions, which mission you want to work with. It installs software for that. And we are going to do that for OLI in this case. Um, we're going to use this GUI that we've been using, but you can do this by using command line configuration also. And the procedure is given here. So if there is a there is no uh, software available for any particular sensor, then you will get a uh, error or let's say a process failure will occur if the mission is not installed. So you you have to install for a particular mission. If the not mission is not available, then you will not be able to of course do the analysis. Also note that Olchi from Sentinel three uh, that is only available through command line and not through GUI. So GUI, it's, uh, we're going to focus on Landsat here, which is available. So it is either automated when you um, will demonstrate that when you go to CDAS and try and install the software, it, it is either automatic in the sense it finds where this directory is, or if, if it is not in your path, you may have to do a little bit of um, manipulation and make sure that the software directory is 
uh, where your uh, CDAS is looking for. Okay, so that's a little bit, uh, if you can't find it, then you may have to make sure that um, CDAS knows where to point. Uh, the directory path has to be included. Once you pick um, the sensor or mission data, then you can just run and then it installs the software. This software, as you can see on this side, um, there are multiple options. So you can have level one browser. Now, uh, remember that the, the demonstration we had last week and CDAS version that you used then, it was mostly for, it was entirely for level two data and not level one. This software allows you to look at all levels. So level one, you can browse and you can generate map. Uh, level two, also you can browse and generate map. You can convert from level two, level one to level two. And what is important to know here is that when you go from level one to level two, you have to apply this atmospheric correction. And for Landsat, it, we will do that here, uh, but that requires ancillary data so that requires um, data for atmosphere, about clouds, about aerosols. These data are also available through um, this software, and then you can use that. Uh, there is geolocation and calibration. Uh, currently, it is mostly for MODIS and WIRS. Um, there is uh, extractors, so special extraction, and also by product, you can do subsetting. Uh, there is level two binning for level three. So you can bin level two data in particular grid to get uniformly gridded level three data. And you can have level three binning from multiple level three files. Uh, you, have, you can do that too. There is map generation for level three and you can look at metadata and also have multi-level processing. So there are multiple options. We're going to focus on this part, level one to level two conversion of Landsat OLI data um, along with correction of uh, Lancet data. So I will have that little demo now in which we'll convert Lancet 8 only data, level one data to level two data. And in between, we'll see how atmospheric correction is applied. This is the demo to generate level two products from level one data from Lancet. So in this case, we would use the L2Gen tool that is available in CDAS to do that process. First, we will open our CDAS application and we will navigate uh, on the top menu to OCSSW and select L2Gen. In order to L2Gen to be activated, you first should have installed the update data processors under OCSSW and select the sensors. In this case, we are going to use Landsat data, so the sensor is only, and uh, click on Run. That takes some time, and after that has been installed, all these different tools will be available. We are going to work with L2Gen. We click on L2Gen, and, and this is the window for this tool. In the main window, you have to include the input file, and that will be the metadata file for the Landsat imagery and automatically will assign a name for the output file. And there you can also see there are other options that you can navigate and select different parametrization to perform the atmospheric correction and to generate um, the right geophysical parameters. So in the main window, we are going to um, select the input file, which is the metadata file of our Landsat data. The output file name automatically load, and uh, here you can see in which folder is going to be located. And uh, if L2J has been installed correctly, you will get um, this information. If you get an error, that means that L2Gen didn't install appropriately. Then you can click on Get Ancillary Data. That's going to be useful to perform the atmospheric correction. 
um, fills should load in this window as well. Then in products you can navigate to the different products that are going to be generated as a result of running the L2 Gen 2. And uh, if you want more than the ones that are selected by default, here is where you go and select those uh, additional products. As you can see, if you go to Radiances and Reflectances, the Remote Sensing Reflectance is selected, so those bands are going to be generated. And these are the spectral bands that are selected to generate the products. Um, that includes the deep blue, the blue, green. Uh, in case you will have, you will like the other bands, uh, the near infrared and the sphere bands, you can also select those here. We are going to leave everything as a default, but uh, this is to show you the different options that are available. Uh, you can also select the water uh, living radiance uh, as a as a product and that's by a spectral band as well in the derived geophysical parameters you can see that chlorophyll a is selected and that, that there are also other products if you would like the surface temperature you can also select it here and uh, regarding more information about these different parameters, you can check the documentation that was shared the previous week, weeks about the L2 Gen tool. There are links there that direct you to the uh, to more information for this uh, for this tool and the different capabilities that it has. So we are going to leave this as default. In processing tools, uh, we are going to modify uh, some of these parameters in order to obtain an appropriate product in our area. As I mentioned, I am focusing on Lake Atitlan, which is located in Guatemala. It's an inland water body, relatively small, and uh, the image that we are processing is during an algal bloom event. The current parameterization that the tool has I already know that it's not going to work there because it has been created for ocean waters. And uh, one of the parameters that we can change uh, in order to work in inland water bodies, bodies with Landsat data is the aerosol parameterization. So in this case, we are going to select no aerosol subtraction, and this is because the atmospheric correction tends to fail in the areas in water bodies that, are th that contain very turbid water. So we select this one and uh, I will also uh, like to show you the other options that L2Gen has. The ancillary inputs on um, this download climatology data that is useful for the atmospheric correction and you can also see that there is information about the algorithms that are used to derive the geophysical parameters such as chlorophyll A. In miscellaneous you can also uh, change the coefficients that are assigned for the chlorophyll A algorithms and uh, this is where you can input your own coefficients in case you have already calibrated one of these algorithms for uh, your area of interest. So we are going to leave this uh, as it is and uh, we are going to run this tool. This will take some time. After L2Gen has run, you will get uh, this window of successful completion. You click OK and the product will automatically upload in the CDAS platform. So you can see that the structure of the products that are created is very similar to the ones that we uploaded uh, from the, the Ocean Color website. So we are going to focus on the raster datasets and uh, these files that are here 
were the ones that were selected in the product window in L2Gen. So we can see that we have the chlorophyll A product and we are going to double click in this one and it takes some time to load given the special resolution which has more detail than MODIS data and, and this is the image. We can uh, zoom in. I uh, told you that uh, I was working on Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. So we are going to zoom in to this area. This was during an algal bloom event in 2015. And uh, this is the lake. We are going to go to the color manager and uh, we are going to modify we can modify the, the range and uh, the colors as well. And we can also activate the masks as we have, we have done before, the land mask. And if I navigate around the image, I can see the values of chlorophyll. You can also try to run the L2Gen with other parametrization. Uh, if, you leave it, if you leave it as default, uh, you will see that uh, you may get some errors. Uh, in case you get errors, uh, such as the atmospheric correction has failed, um, First, you have to identify what the errors were, and that's why it is useful to navigate on the final product and uh, identify uh, what the flags are for those pixels. For example, here I didn't get data, and I can zoom in on this area, and uh, I can expand the flag file and uh, it says that this was a cloud um, because in the cloud eyes it has been assigned as true so this may be the reason for this one if we zoom out uh, and in all this area, we know that this is not water, and I know because I know the shape of the lake, um, but we can have an idea of what happened here. And this has uh, been selected at coastline. If we want to know what each of these flags mean, you can navigate to the mask and layer. You will find the same flags and uh, he will give you um, the coast sea has been um, is a uh, shallow water so this is for the demo of using the l2 gen tool and uh, then we will work with CDAS uh, and in situ data to compare in situ observations with uh, satellite derived observations of chlorophyll concentration. This is the demo to start working with in situ observations and satellite derived observations for water quality. In terms of in situ observations, we already mentioned before that SIVA's website provides a good resource to obtain in situ observations for water quality. So I'm going to demonstrate how to search and download this data and use it in the SIVA's. This is the website for SIVA's and uh, you can do a file search here and you can select the times in which the measurements were made. I'm going to do a general search from 2005 to 2018. 
You can select here the geographic area of interest. I am focusing on the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, then you can also select the parameters that you are interested on. In this case, I'm interested on chlorophyll, so I'm going to select this, and they call them products, and you can perform a search. And these are the results. It indicates the temporality and the location and the product and that we are interested in. Also, they have a water depth. All of these measurements have a, a depth associated. And uh, each of these files represents measurements done by different campaigns. And you can see those results in different ways. You can uh, see it as a map. And you can zoom in to see the locations. And you can also create a plot. For example, you can select date and uh, You can put parameter. We are going to look for total chlorophyll, and uh, you can also include uh, the depth of the measurement. And uh, here you can see the plot of the dates for the measurements. Uh, these are from 2010. And then you can click on this, and the file will download. The fact that you are obtaining this information from CBAS doesn't mean that automatically it's going to be ready and in the right format to be uploaded into CDAS. Uh, you have to check actually what the format is. And uh, for that, uh, I have a file here that was obtained from CBAS that is in the right format. And uh, I want to call your attention about the uh, station data. These are the name of the measurements, to say in a way, at each point. And uh, all this information has to be tab limited. When you see here in the delimiter, it has to be by tab. And the fields, this is another important parameter. You have to have it organized by day, time, the station. This station has to be defined here. And uh, lat long, then the format for date and time is also relevant. If you see here in the first uh, measurement, date is given by years with four digits, month with two digits, and day with two digits. And then the time is given by hour, minute, and second. And here in the units, is, it is specified what is that format. And exactly in that order, and with those units and in that format, is how the information has to be for CDAS to be able to read it. For example, if you click on anything in, on any of these first results that we obtain here. Uh, we can go to this one. And you can do the double check. Station is not defined. And then the, in the fields, uh, the order is different. The delimiter is comma, not tab. And it has sample. It should be a station. But it also has a station one. And ball field, depth, water, and then it has year, month, and date at separate fields. And uh, we already saw that the format has to be like this one. So you have to reformat the information, the, da the data, into a uh, appropriate one in order to see us to upload it. And uh, I recommend that you do that in the text editor. For example, this one that we know that is the right one. We can select this, love this, and we copy, yeah, and we open a text editor. You convert this text editor to plain text and paste this information. And then you can save this file.
as text, as plain text. This was already in the right format, so I don't have to do any modification. For some of the results that I obtained for the Gulf of Mexico, I did have to uh, formatted the information to have it similar to this one and I also trim the products because there is more than chlorophyll here as you can see there are other pigments that are being measured so I just left the water depth and the chlorophyll content and uh, now we are going to open these files into CETAS now that we have seen how to search and download data from SIVAS regarding in-situ measurements for water quality, we are going to see how to upload those measurements in CIDAS and compare them with uh, satellite observations. In this case, uh, I'm going to demonstrate uh, two areas, uh, one for the Gulf of Mexico and one for the, the northeast coast in the U.S., very close to Chesapeake Bay. First, you need to know where the measurements that you have overlap uh, geographically with a satellite image and you have to obtain that satellite image, level 2. I'm going to work with MODIS level 2 data downloaded from the Ocean Color website. And uh, for this, uh, for the Gulf of Mexico example, I have already seen where the observations that I have uh, are and uh, therefore I look images uh, for that and uh, also that overlap not only geographically but also in terms of time. The, I'm going to open the file and we can activate the landmass to see better where we are and uh, now that I already have an image loaded and I know that my observations overlap or fit into this area I'm going to import the CBAS information I can do it different ways I can use the icon that is on the top menu of the CBAS platform or I can also uh, go to vector import and CBAS data. I'm going to use that one and I'm going to search for my file and once you have uploaded like no error has uh, appeared it seems that uh, it was successful but it still is hard to see where it is. Uh, you can see that the file gets uh, loaded and associated to the image uh, and the file image that you are looking at right now. Uh, in order to edit how the layer looks you can go to layer manager and in this button you can edit uh, we can change um, the colors here and uh, instead of a cross which is uh, how it's being shown right now we can use a circle and now it's easy to see easier to see where our observations are as you can see here when you open this file you have the pixel position the geolocation date of the measurement time the station name depth of the measurement and the parameter of our interest in this case total chlorophyll A and in the depth uh, you can see that there are measurements that were done very deep into the water at 70 meters and 40 and 80 so in order to compare with our satellite image we should compare only measurements that were done at the surface level and uh, we are going to reformat this SIVAS data set even further to trim it only for the measurements that uh, were done at the surface level and I have already done that so I'm going to upload that layer um, so in vector import SIVAS data and uh, 
three that here and uh, now you can see that it uh, was added to our uh, files here in the layer management I'm going to uncheck the previous Sivas data and I'm going to change this one okay and these are our uh, locations let's go back here we can open this and now this contain only the measurements that were done at the surface level now we can compare these uh, with our chlorophyll measurements from satellite images uh, we can do that here uh, it's still showing the previous um, plot so we are going to upload that um, update that we have five data points and obviously we do need more to do an appropriate correlation and to have a better idea of how the satellite derived measurement compares with the in situ observation. But uh, this is only to show how that comparison can be done. Uh, in addition, I would like to mention that on the y axis you have the chlorophyll concentration measurement derived from the satellite image, and on the x axis you have the chlorophyll concentration measurement from the in situ observation and uh, you can add the regression line to see what the correlation is you can also change this box size which is going to select the a box of pixels for example uh, if you select um, 3 by 3 is a box of pixels of 3 by 3 or 5 by 5 7 by 7 and uh, that's the mean value that is going to be shown here in the table and it also calculates the standard deviation of those um, pixel values and that's what is shown here um, and you can change also the tolerance here another useful tool is the profile plot you can find that tool on the top menu of the CDAS platform here and this is useful if you want to compare the in situ measurements that you have in your file with the satellite image uh, besides the correlative plot you can also use this as a first view of the information and uh, here um, you can use the file in this case we are going to select the file that it has the measurement for the specific date that we are looking at in the image and uh, in the data field the chlorophyll A um, the once you have that uh, you can also select a box size if you only select one that's taking into account only one pixel the pixel um, that overlaps with the measurement or the path that is being selected here by this line. If you uh, select um, a box size with more pixels, uh, so here it shows the standard deviation in the uh, color around the graph. And once you move, you can see in the image where uh, those values are. So it's recording here in the graph uh, the values from the satellite image. You can also see that um, in the table and like in the correlative plot you can move between the plot and the table that the plot is based on. Here you can see the mean value that is the, the mean value of that uh, number of pixels um, that was selected in the box size, the standard deviation and the real reference value 
So this is another useful tool. An additional quick example to keep processing and comparing in situ observations with satellite imagery will be um, by opening the data that we have uh, for the northeast coast very close to Chesapeake Bay. So you can load these files direct directly from the exercise and uh, that's what we are going to do right now. Uh, I already have downloaded the image so we can go to file and um, open and it's this first one and it loads this is in a very different area as you can see here so we are going to load the chlorophyll product and we can activate the mask so to have a better idea where we are the land mask and uh, you can see Chesapeake Bay is here. I already know that the measurements uh, that are available through SIVAS and that you can also download from the link that was provided uh, overlap in with this geographic area. So I'm going to upload those uh, SIVAS measurements or in situ measurements and in this case I'm going to use uh, this tool of the import field measurements and uh, you can load that file um, that was provided and uh, save it as plain text and then you can load it here and here you can see that it loads in the over the image if i didn't have the image if i tried to do this on my original file over the gulf of mexico it wouldn't load it would tell me that uh, the points are the outside of the area um, that i have available so we can modify um, here the file. You can see that the text file got loaded and is associated to the files for this product. I save it with this name and uh, we can edit the layer here. So we can go to layer manager and uh, you click on the pencil and uh, modify this. I'm going to put this white, black, and instead of a cross, we can use a circle. So it's a little bit easier to see on the image. And you can see that we have multiple measurements there. Uh, but actually, to have a better understanding of what we are looking there, we can uh, go here and double click on the file, and you can see the type of information that is available. So we have measurements first for multiple dates, as you can see here. It also contains the time at which the measurement was made and uh, multiple products were measured. And we have total chlorophyll A, but we also have for other pigments another type of information. Okay. As you can see, we have only loaded one image therefore uh, let's check what is the date of the image that we have here and let me turn me back so in the file you can go to global attributes and check the metadata for this level 2 product that was downloaded from the ocean color website and here you can see it's from november 7 of 2010 this is the date of the image that we are looking at here. I'm going to close the other. And, um, and here we open our in situ data. We can see that we have measurements for November 6, 7. There are a few measurements for November 7. And uh, um, you can edit this file to only have the measurements uh, for this uh, for this date. You can also export this as a shape file and you can uh, work in a different geographic information system platform um, to manipulate this information and also to do this type of comparisons. Uh, but it's uh, useful to see the different capabilities that CDAS has to do this type of analysis. The, other thing we can do a correlative plot 
but we should only compare measurements that were acquired the same day that the image was acquired. Um, another important field here is the time at which the measurement was acquired. The data file, um, the CBAS file, the header, uh, maybe you can also find more information about the, the units of this, if it's in UTC or local time. In the metadata file of your image, you can find the time at which the image was acquired. And this is useful because you would like to compare only the measurements that were acquired close to the time of acquisition, not only the same day, but also as close as possible to the acquisition time. A good reference will be plus minus three hours. Um, because as you can see, it's very difficult to have in situ measurements and even to plan for in situ, in -situ measurements that overlap as exactly as possible with your satellite acquisition. And in this case, we can do a correlative plot, but we are only going to focus on the day that overlaps with the satellite image. So in order to do the correlative plot, you have to have first selected the chlorophyll product here on your, um, on your files, and then you click on correlative plot. In the point data source, you can select the text file that has your measurements and we are going to select total chlorophyll A as the parameter. Right now it's showing all the measurements that are available in this um, text file which was downloaded from Sivas. And on the y-axis, again, you have the measurement derived from the satellite image. And on the x-axis, you have the in situ measurement. You can, we can go to the table. Actually, I'm not going to pay that much attention to the plot because right now we are looking everything. But we only care about these measurements that were collected on the uh, November 7th. Here in the table you can see the mean value, uh, that that's the chlorophyll value derived from the satellite image. And uh, here you have the total chlorophyll A uh, from the reference file in our in situ measurement. And you can see how it compares. Uh, the sigma is the standard deviation for the satellite measurement in case uh, we have a 3x3 three three box selected. Mm -hmm. You can edit this file to only have the measurements for that day and do the comparison that way. Now we are going to see how to calibrate algorithm coefficients for your area of interest in case you have in situ observations. We are going to do this analysis using limited data points. This is not recommended if you want to do this for a real world case. In a real application, you will need a statistical significance. Therefore, at least 30 points will be a good number to do this type of analysis. So the first thing um, I would like to show is that in the level 2 data that you have from ocean color you can go to band attributes and uh, open the chlorophyll A product you can double click there and you can see that in reference is a listing a uh, paper this paper contains the algorithms that were used to generate this product so I have already opened this paper and it's here and actually it explains how the chlorophyll A is being generated. It's actually a combination of two algorithms for waters that have chlorophyll concentration less or equal to 0 0.25 milligrams per cubic meter. They are using the color index algorithm, which is explained here. For the waters who have a higher chlorophyll concentration, it is using 
um, this four order polynomial algorithm. I would like to walk through this algorithm because we need to understand it in order to calibrate al our algorithm coefficients. So it's based on the band ratio between the blue and the green bands. In MODIS we have multiple blue bands. In this case it is using the maximum value in the blue band and uh, is using these different bands and select the maximum value and uh, that becomes the value for the blue band and then is divided by the green band and this is our ratio. Then we calculate the log 10 of that ratio. That log 10 is the x value here and the final chlorophyll A concentration that we see in our product is 10 to the power of the result of this polynomial equation here. So it's a little bit long but uh, we need to understand it in order to update our algorithm coefficients. What we update are these values here. Well, after seeing that, we can generate um, this band ratio that we saw in the publication. And we are going to do that using MathBand. I already created that band ratio my result is here. Once you have used MathBand to create a product, and we saw how to use MathBand last week, you can go back, you can go to that product and go to properties and see the expression that was used to generate that layer. This is the expression that I use. We select the maximum value contained in these three different bands then divided by the, the green band and it's the log 10 of all of this. We run it. And now we would like to extract the values of our image that overlap with our in situ observations. Since we are interested in creating an updated chlorophyll A at the end, that's our ultimate goal, we need to go back to work with the raw data. In this case, our raw data is referring to the spectral bands. That's why we are working with the remote sensing reflectance. I didn't mention before that for to create this band ratio, what I used were the original remote sensing reflectances. So we are going to use tools, pixel extraction, and we are going to extract the pixels that overlap with our in situ observations and this is the tool that we can use in CIRAS to do that. In the input and output file we are going to include the input file that uh, is going to be the base, it's our satellite image and from where the values are going to be extracted and if you see, even the product that I generated got associated to this file. So it's going to extract everything. For all the bands, for my original remote sensing bands, to the chlorophyll product and everything that is there. We can also indicate on which folder and directory is the final product going to be saved and the name of it. In parameters, here is where you can upload the location of your in situ observations. In order to upload a file here, it has to be formatted in the right way. I have already done that, so I can import a file that is tab delimited. I formatted the Gulf of Mexico data that I downloaded from CBAS here, and it loads here. You can also use the pin tool here as soon as you create a pin, it automatically appears here. The other characteristic that it has, if you have a large data set of uh, measurements that were acquired at different times, you can have a time constraint. I will recommend a time difference of plus minus three hours between the time the satellite image has been acquired and the time that the in-situ measurement is acquired. The other important parameter here will be the window size. This 
is indicated with pixel value you are selecting. It is either exactly the same pixel that overlaps with your in situ point or the value derived from a box size that is made of uh, several pixels, for example, a 3x3 or 4x4 or 3 by 3 or 5 by 5. You can also include expressions here. Usually uh, it is recommended that you use a mean value of um, a box of pixels. So we can select 3 here and uh, you can also select the aggregation method. We can use average or mean. And you click here on extract and it's going to extract all the values for each of these different bands and it's going to create a text file with this. I have already opened the file that is created. If you see in name we have the station data that we saw originally on the CBAS file. Then it extracts all the values that are contained in our original level 2 data set. It has the remote sensing reflectance and uh, it includes the mean value. Uh, we selected a box size of 3 by 3. It creates a standard deviation and the number of pixels as well that were used for this to generate this mean value. And it does it for everything for each of the ones that are available in this file. So you have a large data set. But what we are interested on is on the log term band ratio that we created and our original measurements of chlorophyll concentration. When you use the pixel extraction tool, it is recommended that you use it only for the data sets that match both the in situ with the satellite data set. I have already cleaned up this uh, file uh, to select only the dates that match. What we need to focus on, as we mentioned before, are the chlorophyll in situ measurements that were collected that date and the log term ratio uh, of the remote sensing reflectance bands. So I have already organized the information, so I have those two data sets and here we can see the total chlorophyll A that was measured in situ and our mean value uh, for the log 10 band ratio. What we want to do is a regression with this information. I have already done that and you can do that in different ways as long as you have these two data sets that's the most important thing. You can use Excel, you can use uh, R, Python, uh, whatever you, whatever means you, you have to do this. If you are going to use Excel, we can do that very fast here. And we are going to select both the total chlorophyll A that was measured in C2. And we are going to select our band ratio, log 10 of the band ratio that was extracted from our satellite data set. We can uh, go to insert the scatter plot and uh, now we have this and we can click on the points and add a trend line and this open and we are going to select polynomial order 4 and we can displace the equation on the chart and also the R square. And we can increase value. I would like to mention here you can see that the log 10 band ratio value is the same for the different points. So please just uh, Consider that this is no real data, that uh, this is just for example purposes, but when you are working with your data, uh, this should be different, obviously. 
remember that we actually only have two locations and we have different chlorophyll measurements on those same locations so that's why we are having that our data derived from the satellite image obviously has the same values because it's for the same point So now we have these new coefficients and those are the ones that we are going to use to update our algorithm coefficient. In order to do that we can go back to CIDAS and use MATBAND to recalculate our chlorophyll A product based on these um, algorithm coefficients. We already know that X corresponds to the log 10 band ratio that was already calculated so we can go back here to CIDAS and calculate Y if we make reference to our original paper on which it is web based or that was based. So I have already done those calculations using MATBAND and uh, Let me see here. Yeah. I did it in two uh, steps. First, I calculate y, and then, and y is the polynomial equation using these new coefficients. So we can open this expression, and as you see, I am replicating the equation that I got from the polynomial regression. If you see this is the equation here and x represents the log 10 band ratio so I go here and uh, every time that uh, I have to use x and I'm using the band that I have already created. When I have calculated y I can cancel on this and uh, then I calculated the final the new chlorophyll A product which is 10 to the power of Y so this is a very simple one in which uh, we have a uh, base 10 to the power of Y in this case is the result of the polynomial equation and the result will be my new chlorophyll A product that has been calibrated uh, with my in situ data. As I mentioned, this is only for example purposes. In a real application, you will need a statistical significance, so you definitely need more data sets to do this type of analysis, but this is the general workflow to do that. And now actually we can do a simple comparison using our correlative plot. In theory also, if you want to do this to see how good or bad has been your calibration, it is recommended that you do it for a different uh, data set. Uh, for example, the in-situ observations that you are going to use shouldn't be the same ones that you use to calibrate your algorithm because obviously it's going to show better results but you will see the how good or bad um, has this new calibration be when you compare with additional data sets that weren't included in the algorithm development. So uh, but for this example we are going to use the same data so we are expecting to have better results than we had in the past. If you remember our correlative plot in the past was uh, not that good. Uh, so to do this uh, comparison we can go here to our new chlorophyll file and we check on the um, correlative plot. We select the same measurements of uh, March 22nd and our data field will be total chlorophyll A and now we have an R square of 0.99 uh, obviously we are evaluating the same data that we used to calibrate our algorithm we have very limited data points uh, so I do expect if I 
navigating other parts of the image it actually is going to be a little bit bad or very bad uh, because I'm just using this limited information but uh, as I mentioned before please consider having more uh, data points and some of the considerations that you need to take into account when doing this type of calibration is that your in-situ measurements have to match as much as possible the satellite acquisition uh, we saw last week how to identify when is, there is going to be a satellite overpass so you can uh, schedule the in-situ measurements during those overpasses because they had to the in-situ measurements have to be as close as possible to the time that the satellite image was acquired at least the same day if we are outside the plus tr minus three uh, hours difference at least to be the same date so you will have better results and uh, or more appropriate results for this type of analysis Okay, thank you, Africa, uh, for the demonstration. So this brings us to the end of this series. And before that, we want to summarize what we did. It, starting from the beginning, we talked about current satellite missions, which are relevant for water quality monitoring. And as listed here, it's Landsat 7 and 8, Terra and Aqua, uh, SUMI, NPP, um, JPSS, Sentinel-2, a and B and Sentinel-3, these are all currently in orbit. Some, like Landsat and Mode, uh, and Terra, they are since 1999. And these are the recent ones that we talked about. We talked about the sensors available on um, this uh, missions. So Landsat 7 is ETM, plus Landsat 8 is OLI, Terra Aqua Modis, um, VIRS from NPP and JPSS, Sentinel-2A and B has multispectral imager and Sentinel-3 has ocean and lane color instrument OLCHI. They all have different swath width as well as resolution, the highest being MSI at 10 meter, um, then Landsat at 30 meters. Um, MODIS and VIRS, they are moderate ranging from 250 meters to about one kilometer, depending on bands. And then OLCHI also is 300 meters. They all have different special um, coverage also. Uh, they're all polar orbiting, but swath width can be um, 185 or narrow for Landsat, all the way to uh, VIRS, which is about 3,040 3, uh, kilometers. Uh, all, all the um, Terra Aqua and NPP and JPSS, um, they have one to two day coverage, so MODIS and VIRS data are available on that uh, temporal scale. But if you look at MSI, it's five day revisit, um, Landsat is 16 day revisit, and OLCHI is 27 day revisit time. So they all have different spatial and temporal attributes. We also talked about a number of tools. We focused on uh, chlorophyll concentration and sea surface temperature, but from MODIS and VIRS, you also have uh, particulate organic carbon and inorganic carbon, also inherent optical properties are available. So these are all derived uh, NB uh, quantities, and we also show, uh, saw what, kind of, what type of algorithms are used to get these data. Uh, we also talked about level two and level three data access tools, Ocean Color Web and Giovanni. And we had a demonstration of CDAS, which is a software that you install. You had some experience using this, and you analyzed data over Lake Victoria using CDAS. And today, then, it was a little more where we just have L level one data. How can we do atmospheric correction to convert to level two data and then use some in situ data to develop algorithm or even validate the data? So this is the overall summary that using past uh, time series data of satellite observations and in situ data, our uh, algorithm can be or model can be developed using statistical empirical technique. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, in between, you have to do atmospheric correction, which is a little complex and little requires radiative transfer calculations, in which you need information about atmospheric uh, gaseous constituents, aerosols, and clouds also. Once you have all this information, you develop algorithm, you can store model coefficients, and then this model coefficients can be used for current and future satellite data. The advantage here is that in situ data can be very sporadic or they're not continuous, but once you develop coefficients based on this in situ data, these coefficients can be used everywhere where there is satellite information available, so you have a nice continuous spatial coverage. Okay, and we saw that algorithms are developed by using optical, near-infrared, and infrared, and microwave remote sensing observations, okay? And the information can be used for monitoring, uh, say, lakes, estuaries, and coastal oceans. And there is a review article uh, listed here, which has a um, number of review articles, and it shows how different uh, optical and infrared micro bands are used um, in combination or what kind of uh, algorithms are developed to get uh, water quality parameters. So this is something uh, that you can review for uh, more up-to-date information and more specific information how these bands are used. So we want to summarize some of the challenges that we saw in water quality monitoring. So as listed here, for accurate and quantitative water quality monitoring, you have to have co-located spatially and temporally uh, both in situ and satellite measurements. Since in situ measurements can uh, be every once in a while and they are not continuous in space, there has, if they, there is overlap with satellite, then the algorithms or model developed using these two are more accurate. Also, visibility of water quality monitoring in coastal and inland water bodies, it do, does depend on special temporal and spectral resolution of the remote sensing observations. For example, if you have a small lake, um, and which is just a, um, not visible in MODIS being 250 meter resolution, um, it is difficult to, of course, derive water quality parameters in that. Um, and sometimes when there are multiple uh, water quality parameters in high quantities such as sediments or dissolved organic matters or chlorophyll A concentration, they're all present at the same time, it is difficult to separate from uh, the remote sensing measurements. So in situ measurements, then they do have to be there to aid it, and then algorithms have to be refined sufficiently to be able to capture those. Also, it is not, sorry, it's not possible to characterize um, algal types or toxins from only from remote sensing observations. You can look at chlorophyll A concentration, but you will not be able to uh, see whether the algae that you have is toxic or non-toxic or what type of algae it is. That you cannot distinguish that. Moreover, uh, remote, as we mentioned, remote sensing reflectance had to be corrected for atmospheric effect so that uh, for, for accurate algorithm development and actual accurate water quality monitoring. And so you have to know atmospheric constituents. And optical remote sensing observations, when clouds are present, we saw uh, when we were looking at Chesapeake Bay that you cannot see through the clouds, so then you don't have uh, data where there are clouds present. So these are some of the challenges. Nevertheless, um, water quality monitoring has is being done um, by a number of, and the examples given here, a number of organizations. So combi combination of, of, of these multiple satellites, they can be used. So e even if Landsat is every 16 days in between, you have MOTIS and VIRS, MSI, 
um, and then you have old chi also so whichever sensor is available and whenever it is cloud free you can use this yes you have to develop algorithm for each sensor but then um, wherever you have cloud free image from whichever sensor and if you have in situ data uh, you can derive the algorithm and then you can use that um, in in monitoring uh, what quality in, in, in current time or, you know. And then um, it monitoring water quality in inland lakes, it does depend on the size of the lakes. So Landsat being 30 meter resolution, it is um, estimated that about 170K plus lakes globally can be observed using Landsat data because it's 30 meter resolution. Whereas Modis, Olchi, Weirs, they resolve about uh, 1868, uh, so relatively less number of lakes, and this um, is an estimate from EPA. So Landsat really is useful that way, and now MSI having uh, even higher resolution and uh, better revisit time of five day would be also useful in monitoring many, many global lakes. <clears throat> These are some of the examples of remote sensing based regional water quality monitoring. So cyanobacteria assessment network or cyan, that's uh, NASA, NOAA, EPA, USGS project that is monitoring inland lakes where there is algal bloom and cyanobacteria. Um, so they monitor that. Uh, Lake Airy Hep Tracker is from NOAA, NOAA Coast Watch, uh, Copernicus Marine Environment Monitoring Service from uh, European uh, Space Agency and also near real time algal bloom monitoring in North Atlantic. These are some of the links that you can you can see how um, water quality monitoring is done in near real time. And then this is the webinar that we did last year, Introduction to Remote Sensing for Algal Bloom, uh, that um, covers examples of these. So you can uh, even see this webinar for more information. So in summary, um, we saw how you can develop algorithm, how you can use algorithm, how can you can visualize, and how you can use already available data, water quality data from NASA, to monitor um, either inland lakes, coastal region, or estuaries. So with that, we want to thank you for attending uh, this webinar series. And and we, uh, we have a couple of announcements, and then we will open the floor for a question and answer. So thank you again for attending this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, for attending this webinar series. Uh, we will have question and answer session soon. But we just wanted to announce that uh, you know about the homework, uh, homework one and two, they have to be finished and submitted. So if you are having trouble with uh, installing CDAS or having trouble accessing some of the features, uh, as we mentioned, there is a forum that you can join and post your questions. Uh, hi, Amita, this is Africa. Hi, yes. Hi, Africa. Please uh, hi. chime in. Yeah, I would just like to add additional clarification or summary uh, in addition to um, what you provided. Uh, I would like to mention that the algorithms that we are working uh, with, for example, in the exercise to calibrate the algorithm coefficients, those are for ocean color waters. And uh, therefore, they are using the blue and green band ratio. But if you want to monitor chlorophyll A uh, for other type of water that have more, uh, that have different constituents and the color of the water is driven not only by the chlorophyll but by other constituents in the water, you can check uh, the paper that Amita was talking at the beginning about a review of the different ways to estimate uh, water quality because there are algorithms that have been created for specific areas that you can calibrate that may be more appropriate for the water body that you want to study. Uh, and this is for chlorophyll A. The algorithms for other parameters 
are also different. And uh, you also need to check all of the all of those things are important where you are monitoring wire quality. Yes, thank you, uh, Africa. But that's a good point. Also, uh, we will make uh, Landsat data available. That is, we downloaded images for Lake Victoria, and they will be made available through our set website. If you want to try some of the features that Africa demonstrated today. So level one data from OLE for Lake Victoria are there. So you can uh, download those uh, files and convert it to level two. Um, since um, we do not, if you have in situ data for Lake Victoria, you can try um, putting in as text uh, in text format and do the algorithm. But this is mostly for you to work with Landsat data in, in CDAS and use the OCS as to view, um, software to convert data just to learn to do that. So the length of data will be available in a day or so. Uh, the volume of this data is a little larger than Modus data being high resolution. So uh, you will be able to download them for our, from our set website in a day or so. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are still experiencing issues with CEDAS, we recommend and suggest that you visit the Ocean Color Forum. Uh, there are a lot of answers there, and I know that there were some specific issues trying to install the OCSS W um, tool that makes the L2Gen tool available. But uh, for Windows users, you have to do addition, you have to have some additional steps. But everything is explained in the documentation, and we share in the chat the link to the forum as well that explains uh, what has to be done. So now um, we can move to the question answer session, um, and uh, we'll try to address your questions here. So Africa, uh, the first one, it's about algorithm, uh, variables A, A1, A2. Yeah, and uh, those are the algorithm coefficients that are generated to the, regress the regression analysis. And we saw that during the demo. Uh, the way the algorithm was generated originally was also doing this polynomial regression. And uh, that gives you specific algorithms. And you can recalibrate those based on your own in situ measurements. And, uh, and in fact, Ocean Color has gone through different versions of uh, chlorophyll A algorithms. That means that they have been using different coefficients. Every time that they add more data to their uh, in situ data set, they recalibrate the algorithm and they recalibrate it to, and what they are doing there, are updating these coefficients. Yeah. Yeah. Question three is about can we use CDAS to analyze salinity in the estuary? And um, I, I, I would want to say, and Daniel, you can correct me, if you have diff image of salinity, you will be able to open it with CDAS and then analyze if, if I understand correctly. But if uh, you can um, correct me. Yeah. And Oh, it is right. Africa, it is possible, right? If you have a TIFF image of salinity, you should be able to open it in CDAS. Yeah, if it's already uh, created. Uh, but I don't, um, I don't know if you can create salinity uh, information derived from satellite images. I haven't seen that. Uh, yeah. It's either you, you have to have it. Um, your own data. If you already have salinity data in TIFF format or you know in text format, also um, you can um, well, open it with CDAS and analyze. So maybe if you want to do statistics or you want to visualize, it should be possible. Is that right? That's probably. It's hard to say. CDAS can open any file. I mean, but but we officially support the the, the missions that we officially support. They're on the. Um, mm -hmm. 
um, on the, uh, you know, when you do the install processors, those are the missions we officially support. If we haven't written a specific reader for a uh, specific mission, we may or may not support it fully, but CDES can open any file. It's just up to what um, parameters of the file it can understand since we know nothing about that file. Um, the only one that I'm aware of that we have is uh, Aquarius that has a Salinity product. Yes, that, that's what I was going to mention, that Aquarius has Salinity uh, product, but uh, that's not current. That, that mission has sure. ended. Also, Daniel, if you can address the next question, is MSI available through the GUI, or does it need command line work? Um, is that Sentinel-2? Yes. It's not in the GUI. Uh, that I know of. Uh, I, I really don't know much about that particular one. Uh, I know, uh, oh, I forget. I know uh, that Nima, not there. Was, Nima wrote it, and, and I, I really don't know on that one, to be honest. Um, okay, I think we will check and let you know, but I, I think uh, uh, Sentinel data are uh, still, you have to do it command line. Yeah, I mean, command line, yes. I really don't think it, I and definitely not Sentinel 3. Yes. And I don't and, and the GUI no I mean if that's yeah right. miss, but not the GUI. Command line probably yes on, on both. I don't know how well the documentation is though on Sentinel 3. It's not actually officially supported but it's in there. As far as I know it's not officially. I mean I don't know how that but So if you go to the GUI OC SSW, you will see that uh, no Sentinel uh, data are there. So it has to be done through command line. Probably the only documentation would be the, uh, you know, like if it's L2Gen, which you're running, L2Gen and help, you may see something in there. Um, the 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 code is all available, so you can actually look at the source code, the C source code. Not that anybody necessarily wants to, but that is the documentation officially, sort of. So, so next question is, can we do sediment analysis of river using CDAS? So uh, uh, my response would be if you have in situ data for, for sedimentation or sediments, then you can use um, officially available sensor um, uh, through CDAS. And what Africa showed for chlorophyll A concentration, you can derive algorithm based on satellite and in situ data. In Africa, you can join in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, as long as your satellite, the satellite data that you are using has enough uh, spatial resolution, uh, yeah, it will be possible. I think that Landsat A can be used. And uh, again, the algorithms that you use have to be different than the ones that we saw here because these are for chlorophyll A and also for ocean waters. Uh, there is a lot of literature using Landsat data to monitor sedimentation and uh, they use uh, different bands. Uh, mostly they use a combination of red, uh, near infrared, and green bands sometimes for that. Yeah. The next question is, how can I know if any lakes and bays in my city are monitored by a NASA satellite? Um, so all the satellites would be going over because they are polar orb orbiting satellites that we're talking about. All of them we talked about are polar orbiting satellites. So it's very likely that they do go over the lakes and bay in your city. Now, what the resolution is of the lakes that you are talking about uh, or the bay area that you are viewing, that will decide which satellite would be uh, most useful to you. But we talked about different tools. Um, so uh, Ocean Color Web will tell you about MODIS and VIRS. And if you look at USGS Earth Explorer, 
and just point into your area, you will see um, the Landsat data for that. MS, MSI data are also available through USGS Alpha Explorer. So this is a good question, uh, question seven. Instead of generating level two data in CDAS, why can't we directly use level two data from Earth Explorer? So a lens of data, level two data available in Earth Explorer, uh, at most, you know, that they're more useful for land remote sensing. They, the atmospheric correction is more accurate if you do it in CDAS. So you can uh, try and use and see how you get different results. Perhaps if you use level two data from Earth Explorer and you start from level one data and then convert it to L2 using CDAS. So atmospheric correction is done specifically for water bodies, over water bodies mm -hmm. in CDAS. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and CDAS doesn't officially support all these other uh, things like level two data from Earth Explorer was generated there, not by our program. So it doesn't necessarily know all the uh, nuances within that data structure. So um, that's a big difference. When CDAS opens our level two file, it knows that it's our level two file and it knows how to handle it best. So. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to estimate lake depth from remote sensing data? So uh, right now, uh, remote sensing cannot provide depth, I believe. But um, I think um, SWOT mission will help in that direction. Yeah, what can be derived is height with the JSON. Uh, yes, so see, water level height can be derived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not depth. Water data, yes. Mm -hmm. So in situ measurements um, in in CDAS, so CBAS is the one that you're talking about, and so mm -hmm. website. Um, that CBAS information is available and I'll give you the website. That's where all the information about instruments would be. Mm -hmm. So earlier, um, we received a comment from a participant about uh, Chesapeake Bay that sometimes uh, chlorophyll concentration data are collected not right at the surface, but at some depth. So you have to know uh, that information too. And so it is important to know uh, which instruments are used and how and where the data are collected, in situ data are collected. So I'm just going to give you CBAS uh, website that you can get more information about uh, in situ data and instruments used. Hmm. Yeah, and just to add many of these data files uh, in the header information, they have some description about uh, uh, the instruments that were used or metadata about how the measurements were made or even links. Uh, but it varies file by file. It's not like all the campaigns that collect the data have that information. Some are more descriptive than others, but uh, there is also additional information in the header of the original CBAS file that is downloaded from the website. So question 10, um, we're estimating chlorophyll A concentration for each pixel. How about the variability of chlorophyll A concentration according to depth for the pixel? Uh, so do we suppose it to be nearly constant along the vertical? So, uh, and Africa, you can correct me, uh, but it depends where you are collecting your in situ data, at what depth. Uh, in most cases, they are collected at the same depth. And so what you're getting is, is 
chlorophyllic concentration at that depth, no matter what the water depth is. And we're not assuming that it's constant everywhere, but only information we have is that wherever the in situ data were collected at that height, this would be most representative. Mm -hmm. no, yes, I, I agree. Usually we use the close to the surface level measurement. And as Amita mentioned, sometimes the algorithms have been created with uh, uh, measurements that have done at a deeper level. And, uh, but, but that's it, we don't have information about what that concentration of constituent is in the column of water. And uh, it will be very hard to derive that from the satellite imagery. I think that you can do that within in situ measurements when you are measurement, measuring chlorophyll or any other water quality parameter at different depths. So that gives you an idea of how is the how that constituent moves in the column of water. But otherwise with satellite data it's just a snapshot of the information. Is it possible to downscale MODIS um, level two chlorophyll A with Landsat eight or Sentinel two to obtain high spatial and temporal resolution images? So um, I'm not um, aware of chlorophyll A concentration, but for some other parameters, it has been done, especially like uh, vegetation index or uh, evapotranspiration. Uh, MODIS and Landsat combined data are used. Uh, also, uh, MODIS, I mean, Landsat and MSI um, combined data are also available from NASA. So it has been done that multiple sensors have been uh, used um, together. I, I, I believe that, again, there has to be some statistical um, analysis done or algorithm developed to do downscaling you know, if you want to. So when you have co-located MODIS and Landsat for a certain region for a number of days, then you can derive some kind of relationship between low resolution and high resolution chlorophyllic concentration, and that may be of use to downscale it. And CDAS, that would be some kind of uh, mapping of the two and co-locating them together. So the next question, uh, Daniel Africa, if you can answer, is there improvement in, in KD490 in CDAS? Oh, did you say me? Yeah, uh, yeah. You, if you, if um, I, that's like yeah. algorithm. I, I, I wouldn't know that. That would be like it sh should be on the the OBPG uh, our, our our website as far as about the specifics of the algorithm itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, for what I do, I develop the GUI. So and the process. Oh, um, if I understand correctly, if you're if you're talking about MODIS KD490, it is the same that you see in um, Ocean Color Web. That is actually that that data are actually um, when you open the file, you get the same data in CDAS. So I'm, I don't know whether improvement is there. It's the same data set that you are looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, CDAS matches, I mean, that replicates the data that we provide at OBPG and it uses that algorithm. I don't know if that algorithm has changed over the years, so I can't speak to that. So why there is huge variations in in situ and satellite derived chlorophyll A? Africa, you, you I th yeah, I think that this vary depending upon of the area that we are looking at. The current chlorophyll A algorithm that the ocean color generates is very accurate in the deep waters. Um, but if you move closer to the coast, there may be some uh, discrepancies there. And that's because the large data set that is used to calibrate the algorithm has more information on the uh, deep oceanic waters. And uh, if you want to have more accurate results on the coastal areas, 
you have maybe sometimes it's, it's not going to be that good. Also, uh, there is a lot of implications of the complexity of the waters. There, the, wa the color of the water is not only driven by chlorophyll A, but also by other constituents, and and so it is it is hard to get, to have a higher accuracy there um, because the the algorithm has been developed with data that uh, has more representation of deep oceanic waters. And and Daniel, I don't know, you would like to to add more to this? The only thing I would add is that the satellite footprint would not, not necessarily match your in situ data measurements. Uh, your satellite footprint is a full um, footprint measuring all that area, and then, but you don't have anybody out there measuring that full footprint. So if the water is varying, then it's going to be hard to match. We usually think 30% match is a good match, but that all depends on what you're measuring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it is point measurement versus like a, a pixel, which is more like an average information over a larger area. And we usually, when we match, we instead of a single pixel, we use a five by five box is the standard. So you're actually measuring a big area because you're trying to beat down uh, satellite noise and a bunch of other variances. There's papers on it, um, but you're basically matching up a large uh, surface area with a point, however you slice it. Mm -hmm. So there's one more question. What algorithm was used to generate L2's chlorophyll A products in MODIS? If you review last uh, week's presentation, um, Actually, both weeks they talk about the first week um, provides link to the algorithm page where you have um, all the information about uh, how the algorithm was developed and what was the algorithm. So if there are no more questions, um, we would like to thank you for attending this webinar session. Um, it was a little advanced, and uh, some of you are having difficulty with CRAS, but hopefully you can resolve that and use the tool uh, as it is quite um, useful for doing processing. So on behalf of Africa Flores and myself, we, we want to thank all of you. Also, Daniel knows for his time and help with this uh, webinar and question answers. We also want to thank our RSET team, uh, Brock Levins, Elizabeth Hook, and Selvin Hudson, uh, for helping us um, in various ways um, in accomplishing this webinar series. Yeah, and uh, Amit, I will also like to extend the thanks to the Ocean Color uh, group who were responding all of our inquiries regarding the use of CIRAS and the uh, installation and L2Gen. So uh, thank you, and we look forward to your feedback. Uh, you will receive a survey link, and we request that you complete the survey when you receive the link, because your feedback is very important to us. And also, please submit all the homework uh, by 26th of um, September. <laughs>